there folks and welcome or welcome back to Nippon Trading International's Japan Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host Ziv Nakajima again and this podcast is brought to you among others by Emil Gorgis of realestate.jp. He's a Tokyo real estate agent who specializes in serving international or mixed nationality families who are looking for the perfect family home. So Emil's an Australian, he's been living here in Japan for over two decades now, and for about half of that time he's been buying, selling, and managing real estate properties in Tokyo on behalf of his own family and a great many happy clients. And he also acts as a mortgage broker on behalf of his clients. So he's got dedicated loan officers in many of the Japanese mega banks. And if you're a regular listener of the podcast, you probably already know him from our JREP, the Japan Real Estate Experts Panel Sessions which means that you're already aware of the fact that the man is an absolute fountain of wisdom on all things related to real estate in Japan, and in particular to family homes, the greater Tokyo metropolitan area, and mortgages. And most importantly, he's incredibly generous with his time and advice, which he's more than happy to provide at no cost or commitment to anyone asking. So if you've been thinking about buying your home in Tokyo, but you've been sitting on the fence for a while, or you just want to have a chat in English with a real expert, Drop him a line on sales at realestate.jp. Hit him up today and start exploring your options. All right. As always, before we get started, quick reminder, just in case you've been living under a rock, that the spring session of the Japan Real Estate Summit is taking place in about a week and a half in Akihabara, Tokyo. That's Saturday, April 6th. Tickets have been selling fast, as is normally the case. We're now at about half of the venue's capacity for in-person attendance and about a third of the Zoom room's capacity for the live stream. And of course, selling more by the day. So if you haven't yet secured your in-person or live streaming tickets and you do want to make sure you don't miss out on the best industry event in Japan, which will give you the opportunity to network with dozens of like-minded property enthusiasts, listen to and pick the brains of our experts panel, including Tracy Northcott, Blanca Kobayashi, Anton Warman, Emil Gorgis, Joey Stockermans, and Daigo Satosan, our two new guest speakers just announced, and of course yours truly, hop over to nippontradings.com, that's N-I-P-P-O-N, Nippon Tradings, with an S, all one word, click on the Japan Real Estate Summit link at the top, and come join us for an awesome day, live or online. Now, for today's episode, again, two back-to-back conversations. Uh, You'll notice I'm doing a lot of this recently, mainly because the backlog of content that we need to publish is getting a bit ridiculous. You'll notice that I'm spooking last October's summit at the end of this first conversation, which should give you an idea of how behind we are. And those are both on the topic of investment properties today. So this first video conversation is with a young but quite experienced investor from the US who's about to invest overseas for the first time. We analyze his existing investment portfolio in the U.S., try to see how it's structured and how we could complement it with his first few Japanese investments for diversity purposes. So we talk cash flow versus potential growth potential, short-term versus long-term residential properties, and how much work is involved in both, the availability of financing for non-resident investors like himself, both from domestic and foreign lenders, and what he would be able to buy with either his cash or alternatively his leveraged purchase budget projections. Also a bit about loan terms, interest rates, and then about how our services work, what we do for our investor clients, how management works, cost of maintenance, renovations, repairs, which also led us naturally to talk about condo units versus mansions, um, uh, sorry, condo units or mansions, houses versus entire building purchases, advantages, disadvantages of each of those property types and what they're best suited for. A little bit about tenants, how to vet them, how rental prices are determined, locations around the country and specifically around Tokyo, which is more familiar with, why yields are so low and how long that might last and much, much more. So enjoy the conversation and I'll see you again on the other side. Awesome. So let me just scroll down through your email because I've got no memory to speak of. Give me a second. Um, Okay, nearing the completion of one of your properties, planning on selling it off to the right buyer, and then you would like to use the profit to possibly invest into Japan. Okay. Uh, Different real estate business models. Um, Okay, so when you say business models, what did you have in mind? Yeah, so um, first off, thank you for meeting me. I, I appreciate it. Um, so when I said business models, I guess what I really meant is like in terms of like appreciation versus like cash flow. 
um, because I know some investors buy for more so appreciation, some are more um, geared towards cash flow. And from what I've heard from your podcast, it, not so much um, appreciation, I think, in Japan. Is that correct? Um, well, I mean, with, with a caveat, the last 15 years or so have been pretty good uh, in major metropolitan centers. So let's say Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka, Central Yokohama, Kobe City um, have all gained in value. Kyoto gains kind of steadily over time, a bit slower, but definitely gains in value as well. But that's on the back of 25 years of deflation and a shrinking workforce, which yeah. are very, quite serious tailwinds. So not having a crystal ball, I would say we advise most of our clients, at least, not to bank on that as a strategy. Definitely make sure the cash flow is there. But if you'd like to also purchase, if you can live with slightly lower yields and you can purchase in one of those um, that tend to do very well when the economy does well, then that's definitely a, a hybrid strategy that you could uh, pursue. But I guess the, the main question is, what does the rest of your investment portfolio look like otherwise? Let, let's say in other countries, other asset classes. Um, so right now, the three um, properties that I sent you are all in the United States, they're all in Texas. So this okay. would be my first time investing internationally. Um, I, I've been to Tokyo once, and that yep. was this year in March. Um, but I was only there for like nine or, I think, nine or ten days. So this would be my first time investing internationally. Okay, and the properties that you have, are they cash flow oriented, growth oriented? What, what are they like? Um, both. So I got really lucky. So um, in the United States, the market was doing really well in like around 2020, 2021. The interest rates were historically low, I think at like around like 2%. Yep. Um, so I, I took advantage of that. At the time, I didn't really have that much money. <laughs> Um, but I, I bought in and I took a risk. Um, and one of the properties I bought, I bought it for uh, 219. Um, and since then, it's appreciated to 305. And it's only been maybe two, three years, something like that. I don't expect that again by yeah. any means. That was, I know, obviously, I know that was very, very lucky. Um, so I guess in terms of that, um, that property, um, it's, in revenue, it's doing about like right at under 20K. Um, in terms of cash flow, it's I would say it's probably cash flowing about maybe maybe like nine or ten percent of that. You bought it in cash, did you? A good amount. So I bought it with a VA loan. So um I guess in the United in the United States there's 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 certain different kinds of loans, right? Like conventional loans or like um they offer VA loans too, which are for veterans. Yep. Of the United States military, um, which gives us really good deals. So it helps us like go and buy into the market. Um, so the nine ten percent that you're saying is that cash on cash for what you're paying monthly, or is that compared to the to the actual price of the property? Yeah, it's cash on cash. Cash on cash. Okay, so probably more like five, four, five percent if we were to compare it to the actual value versus yield, right? Yes, that's yeah. correct. Um, so are all three of them like that similar? No. So that's, that's the, um, one that I bought in 2021, I believe, um, the land that I'm working on right now, that one is going to be, I guess what they call it in Tokyo, like a am in Paku. Yep. I don't know if that's the right term. Airbnb um, kind that, of. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's what I, I have it out as it's in the hill country in Texas. Um, and there's not very many restrictions there. Yep. So not really any HOAs or, um, like deed restrictions yep um so that was kind of my plan um but i had somebody approach me um saying that they might be interested in that's a cash buyer and that's what i'm trying to finish right now is um, completing it so i bought the land raw um it only had a water meter in it um and then i added a septic tank and i added um an electrical infrastructure and then yep. i put a tiny house on top of it um so it has all that stuff on it now so I'm trying to get money for it. And how are you? How are you uh, enjoying slash capable of managing the fact that it's short term stays? Because that that cons consumes a lot more bandwidth, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. So like, I feel like a lot of people think it's like super passive, no, right? Like, it's not. It doesn't work that way at all. No. Like, I've had 
man, I've had people ask me for like the weirdest things, like, which probably some of the things I shouldn't even mention on here, but like, yeah, um, people, people can be very needy, <laughs> even if yeah. you try to like send stuff out ahead, um, like, and have like all the amenities and everything set up, things can still go wrong. I've had, I had a, an instance where um, the power shut out and we had to go get, we had to drive like 45 minutes to get a new breaker. Oh, you're managing them yourself, hands on. Yeah, I'm managing them myself. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I haven't man, I haven't had a property manager other than for the single family home that I have. Um, but that's because the guy that's the property manager is also my friend, and he's yep. also a licensed real estate agent. And um, him and I had a deal that if he managed the property for me, that I would keep buying real estate from him. That's so awesome. <laughs> that's kind of yeah, that's kind of what we worked out. Um, so yeah. Okay, so that's the that's, second one. You mentioned three, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the so the third one, the third one is the one I actually live in. <laughs> okay, so gotcha. That, yeah, that one, um, that one I bought for $325. Um, and that one's appreciated like maybe like 20K since then. So that one's not too bad, but um, really I, I got lucky with that first one. And that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. Um, okay, gotcha. I want to, I want to, I want to get rid of that, that Blake property that I have because it's, it's pretty sought after, um, as far as like the area people, yep. for whatever reason, people are going out in the middle of nowhere, I guess, getting away from everything and just being out, like out in the country. It's also like, it's probably like 0.2 kilometers from, a like a really big lake. Um, okay. Right now the lake is dried up. So that's why I got it for such a good price. <laughs> um, but typically it'll, it'll come back. Okay, yeah. so let, let's call it two investments. I'll put the house that you're living in aside for a moment. Hopefully, it'll gain in value, but we don't know. So you've got one that you'll be liquidating that's been generally high yield, uh, but kind of a, a bit of a headache, and one that's generating kind of safe and stable returns on, I'd say, again, I'm, I'm not taking the loan into account, but let's say 4 or 5%, so kind of stable um relatively hassle free i'm assuming i mean i know that u.s yeah. tenants are not as easy as japanese tenants but you haven't had too many issues from the sounds of it right yeah and my and my property manager takes care of everything for me so i, I don't i've never even met the tenants that are in that house he okay. does he does everything the credit checks if there's any kind of attorney's fees or they yep. do something crazy, he handles all of that um <clears throat> okay well Assuming that this is your first investment overseas, definitely in Japan, but also overseas, um, and what kind of budget were you thinking about to to invest overseas? Um, so, from listening to your to your show, I've heard it's pretty much near impossible for foreigners to get any kind of like um, loans or any kind of like. Um, um there. There are a couple of options, but those require either setting up a company in Japan, which comes with like three, four thousand bucks a year and just corporate upkeep costs. So that's probably only valid if you're going to be investing in, let's say, half a million and over. Otherwise, it's kind of eating into your income. Um, the other option is there's a Singapore lender that will lend, but only for uh, condo units. So you're not going to have any, I mean, you're going to have a, a bit of the land, which is shared between the uh, owners, but you're not actually going to be able to benefit from any growth or at least not as much as a fully landed property. Right. Right. Um, and the, the first one charges something like two and a half percent interest. The second one, something like three and a half percent. That's so low. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it is. But um, the U.S. is at like eight percent right now. Really? Wow. Yeah, it's insane here. Okay, and so I mean, th there are options, but each of them would also have a minimum required uh, asset price. So, what what kind of cash outlay do you have? Let's say, let's um, say, take a loan. How how much cash can you put into it? So, so without um selling the lake property i have around 50k in cash if i can sell a lake property which i want to do like yeah. more more now like sooner than later um i know that i can get like easily 100k for it like cash back from it because i have a lot of cash um that i put into the deal into the lake land so now i'll get it back um it's it's not levered very much like there's maybe like probably like maybe forty thousand. Of a, of a loan on that entire thing and it's worth probably around like 220 and i think i can maybe sell it for like 
very, very, very like minimum, like maybe 160, 170. So then you'll have a total of 100 or 100 or 150, including what I, you I think between then, yeah, between then. Yeah, between okay. 100 and 150. And then plus the 50K cash. So I, okay. I would call it conservatively maybe 150. Okay, so I think from memory, both lenders um, would require asset price of 10 million yen, which at the moment is something like 80,000 US, I think, or 70, okay. 70, 80,000 US. Not really, it. that's all they need? Um, I think so, let me check. Not bad at all. Let me just confirm. Um, what's that, 10 million Japanese yen. In that's US. the other reason why I want to invest because I love the exchange rates there. Yeah, not a bad. Oh, even less, sixty six thousand at the moment, sixty seven. Yeah. Um. So I guess those are options to you. But if we're going with the one that requires you set up a company, then you're talking about, um, let's see how much. Yeah. So I, like, if the corporate upkeep is going to be like, let's say, worst case scenario, four thousand bucks a year. I guess you don't want to pay more than five ten percent of your income um just for that right that's a bit of a yeah. risk. how how difficult is it i mean we don't have to get too like into it but is it pretty is it pretty easy to say i open a, a kk there and i have like a lawyer and a cpa and i can pay them to take care of most of the things for me is it pretty easy or what i have um, to do you, you'd um, probably need a gk not a kk but um yeah, I mean, I'm it's a really process. Awesome. It's, it's a process. Yeah. They can do it for you. It's a process. We're actually, we just have the first customer. Most of our customers are, we're not interested in these loans, but we have one who's finalizing one of them now. Um, mm -hmm. There's a bit of a debate now on whether, because they require the uh, Japanese resident as, um, as director of the company. Uh-huh. Um, and we can provide that service, but what we don't want to do is to be in any way um, obligated or, or like, you know, like legally liable for any legal or financial. Yeah. yeah. So, understandable. I, I'll if you get in touch with me again in a month, I'll let you know if that was able, if we were able to sort that one out or not. Okay. Um, as a, I guess as a contingency, I have a friend um, that's a Japanese resident in Tokyo. Um, resident as in permanent resident. Yeah, he's he's Japanese national. Like he's oh Japanese, Japanese national. Okay, um, Fukuoka, but I think he lives in Tokyo. Would he um, be Would he be okay though with having that obligation? I don't. I can't speak for him. Um, yeah. but um, that's that's something that I could ask him. Him, him, and I have talked about doing business together before. Yeah, and that's, that's that's the reason why I want to do business in Japan. Um, and why I, I'm kind of interested in the. You said it was a GK. Yep. Um, why I'm interested in, in that um, because I I consider trying to um, do this like long term, I guess. Now, here's some big news for anyone interested in Akia, the abandoned vacant homes that are abundant all around Japan for very attractive purchase prices. Akia Mart, our latest sponsor, is a recently founded online search and discovery tool for Japanese real estate. Its user interface will be very familiar to users of Zillow or Redfin. The platform essentially scouts the internet for property listings, translates them into English, and displays prices in US dollars, all in one place and with a dynamic map interface that makes browsing, finding, and shortlisting your favorite properties a piece of cake which any of you have been struggling with the dozens, if not hundreds, of Japanese property websites that are available online and their very clunky interface will probably find a real blessing. They've got already over half a million listings on the platform and the database is expanding daily, ranging from abandoned rural homes to luxury urban properties. Akia Mart makes it easy to find your dream home in Japan, regardless of your budget. Now, while the platform is essentially free for use, Here's an exclusive offer for listeners of the podcast. You can use the promo code NTI to receive $5 off Akia Mart Pro. The subscription will unlock a bunch of very attractive features for you, including unrestricted access to the entire nationwide property database and a whole range of filters, which will help power charge your search for that elusive perfect home and make it even easier. So hop over to akia-mart.com. That's A-K-I-Y-A-M-A-R-T akia-mart.com and kick off your search today. Okay, so let's take into conservative estimate. Let's say that you've invested 600,000 US and you're getting something like 4% uh, before tax. 
So that's 24,000 US. Um, 4,000 of 24,000 is going to be like what? Six uh, divided by 24,000. Yeah, that's like 16% of your income just to keep the company alive kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. It might be a bit cheaper if he sets up the company um, himself. But actually, if he sets up the company himself, then he could maybe apply for a normal loan that, uh, sorry, if he's going into business with you, then he could maybe apply for a normal individual, or if he has an existing company, an investment loan. Um, so and then, so the, the contingency with those loan companies, it had, you, you have to have a Japanese national as part of the, the company structure? As a, as a director of the company, yes. Okay, the representative okay. director. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out now if that means that they actually have to be a shareholder, which means they'll have to share in the financial obligations as well. Right. Or they can just yeah. be a salaried employee or not. So once we have that figured out, I'll let you know. So okay, so yeah. that's that's one option. If he wants to be a part of it, it'll definitely make it cheaper because you wouldn't have to hire somebody like us, which is about uh, twenty thousand yen per month to to be in that role. Mm -hmm. I know accountants and lawyers provide that service too, but I think they charge something like 50,000 yen a month for memory. Yeah, I'm sure it's not cheap. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's one option. The other option, if you want to go condo units, is the uh, Singapore lender. I can put you in touch. Uh, I'll send you the brochure. It's got contact details on the bottom there. And that's going to be an option as well. So let's assume, uh, let's continue the conversation assuming that you're not getting a loan. So I'm going to say your cash outlay would be somewhere between 50 to 150. Well, when do you think you'll know if you're selling that lake property or not? So I just found out today, my broker, the one that manages the other property that I have, he's, he's also my real estate broker. So he texted me today saying that he might've found a cash buyer for it, um, but he needs to go talk to them. So that's like the soonest that I know is, is just that. Okay. Um, so, but you're saying it's relatively you know, it's, attractive it's, property. It's, so. yeah. Yeah, it's it's ready to go. So whoever buys it, they could easily be a turnkey Airbnb. That's the, that's the thing. Okay, okay. So let's let's assume uh, one hundred and twenty-five thousand, and let's talk um, as if you're not taking a loan. Obviously, you'll have more options okay. if you do, but let's assume you're not borrowing here. Um, then that opens up most of the market for you. We can get some. Older and older and smaller, but even some Tokyo units uh, at that price, they wouldn't be super central, but they'd probably be in relatively good locations. And then the question becomes, I, I'm assuming you don't want to have another short term state property. We're talking long term leases, right? So I wouldn't mind. But from what I've heard again, on your, I listen to your show a lot, man. Like, so <laughs> um, I heard you talk about how something for Mimpaku's for short term rentals that it had to be on certain uh, weekends or it can't be on certain days or something like that or next to schools? Depends on the municipality. Each of them will have their own local regulation. So the national framework just says you can minpaku um, up to half the year. Okay. But you, and then the, the, the other half of the year, people usually make up for it with monthly rentals, which just falls under normal rental. Um, but you could apply for a hotel license. It's not that big of a deal. And then you would be able to rent it out minpaku throughout the year. Um, but what all of that means is that, um, number one, we'll have to buy more central properties, a little bit newer, preferably family sized. If it's within a condo, uh, if it's within a kind of owner union condo situation, then you can only do monthly. You're not going to be able to do minpaku at all. So it ha everything has to be rented out with a lease in place, even if it's a short term lease. So it has to be for a period of one month or more and with a rental lease in place. And the lease can just be a single page kind of lease, but it has to be a normal rental, not a short-term stay with check-ins and check-outs and so forth. Okay. So and the, the condo wouldn't be eligible for the hotel license, right? Not for a minpaku or hotel license, no, because the owner union would never allow it. And unless they specifically write in the, um, in the owner uh, rule book that they allow it, which 99% of them would never do, then yeah. you're not going to be able to, uh, but monthly rentals are still an option if at least there's a monthly rentals capable uh, company in the area that can service it, which again is a lot easier in the more central and, and bigger city the property is in. Mm -hmm. 
So that's an option with condo units. Um, I mean, the owner unions still don't like it, but the monthly rental companies know how to work around them. Kind of, right. they hassle them instead of the tenants, and when they're fine with that. <laughs> and so that's an option for actual minpaku or um, actual minpaku or hotel license. You will need to own the entire structure. Yeah, that can so be buy like an actual hotel, right? Um, yeah, they call it a hotel, but the, the the requirements are not that strict. It requires a bit more fire and safety regulation, something that looks like a reception area, but can be like a fully automated check-in, check-out machine kind of thing. Um, so it, it's nothing insurmountable, but then we have to plan in advance, research the local municipality um, and see what their regulations are and research local license uh, license management companies in the area because they have to be minpaku or hotel license for management um, and then we're looking at different kinds of properties as well so you could potentially even buy if you do end up getting a loan you could potentially even buy a small oh sorry but another thing i totally forgot another thing is um the lenders will, as as the term of the loan, you're only allowed to let, uh, lease the properties out long term, no minpaku or monthly or anything of that sort. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a really important detail. Yeah, they used to force you to work with their property managers for the lifetime of the loan, um, just to make sure you're not doing that. But right. these days, I think they've dropped that requirement. But if somehow they do find out that you're leasing out short term, they could just, you know, recall the loan or force you to switch to another loan. And that's something that you probably want to avoid. Yeah, I don't I don't want to do anything that's like looked unfavorably. <laughs> I'd yeah. rather do everything the right the right way. Um, yeah. So so bearing that in mind, let's assume you're not going to be able to get a loan if you want to go the uh, Minpaku hotel license route, which leaves you not with a small building, which you could have gotten if you had a loan, but maybe at best a older family home kind of thing that you could convert convert into short term stay. Okay. How, Another thing how, to consider is though with short term stays can be very seasonal, can fluctuate a lot with the economy and whether you know if we have something like borders closure again that everything goes to zero. Okay. So, and again, as you're probably aware, the mental bandwidth, like the amount of decision making and tweaking, and um, you know looking at the rates and vacancy rates and occupancy rates and how much you're charging and how much the competition is charging, the property managers who do that will do all of that for you, but they'll constantly give you suggestions that you need to approve or disapprove, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking maybe for your first foray overseas, just go with long-term rentals. And then if and when a tenant moves out and you're in the mood, you can try to convert that maybe. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was leaning towards was the long-term route because I feel like it's more of a, I guess, less less moving parts, right? Like you less moving parts and more stable, reliable income as opposed to something that could fluctuate a lot. Yes. I, I mean, potentially it could double your yield though, but maybe leave that for the second property kind of thing. So you said you said the lenders don't let you do long-term leases, right? Uh, the lenders yeah. will not allow will only allow long-term leases. Okay. They only allow long-term leases. Okay. Yeah. Um and again, they might not find out, but let's not let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's not. Um, okay. So what what would I be able to get if I put 150k of my cash? Um so um let's say 125 US oh, yeah. at the moment that is 18 18 and a bit million yen. That will get you some quite nice condo units or family homes if they're a bit more suburban mm -hmm. and then with long-term leases if you're looking um if you're looking at tokyo and central osaka i'm guessing the best you'd get would be about four percent for a family size property so they yield less but they do family tenants do tend to stay in place a longer time and take better care of the property as well um but they are just Japan population being the way it is that a family takes a longer time to source. So when a property becomes vacant, you'll probably have slightly lo uh, longer vacancies. But then when you do find a tenant, they'll stay in place a long time. But the yield is lower and you need to consider that in between tenants, you obviously need to spruce up the property a bit that the larger the property, the more that's going to cost every time. Right? Okay. And your, your company manages properties too, right? 
via so, property managers. We work with third parties anywhere in the country. So we will be the one managing the managers kind of thing on your behalf. If you're going to be buying in um, central Tokyo, central Osaka, I could potentially put you with a management company that can service you in English. Um, okay. But just bear in mind, a large part of our work um, consists of replacing property managers when they're not doing such a good job. So whether you'll always be able to work with someone directly or you might have to bring us in, I don't know yet. Okay. Um, what I guess as far, and, and I know this might be kind of um, an up in the air question, but as as far as like, say I buy a property, right? right like, like you said, right? With the 125, um, about how much do I expect to spend annually to, I guess, upkeep the property? Because I'm, I'm not very familiar with Japanese homes or, or architecture or anything like that. Yeah, so if you're not going the Minpaku or hotel route, I would probably stick to condo units because then you only need to care about the interior, right? That's a really good point. <laughs> yeah, and then, I mean, it's not that you're not paying for, for the structural maintenance, but you're paying a fixed fee every month that you've already factored into your yield. And then the, the building management company via the owner union takes care of anything structural. So you just need to worry about the interior. Um, but those, again, would only be able to convert them into monthly rentals in the future, not in Paku, nothing like a short-term stay, right? Okay. And then yeah, the yeah. interior, um, so with studios or one-bedroom apartments, which is what most of our clients own, um, we say normally about 60,000 yen uh, per year of tenancy, somewhere between 60 to 80,000 yen per year of tenancy. So if you had the tenant move out after um, you know a couple of years, it's going to be worst case hopefully just a thousand fifteen hundred bucks. But if they if they've moved out after a long period, and especially if they're you know an old man who kept the windows constantly closed and and smoked in the room, which a lot of them do, then obviously that's going to be twenty thirty thousand worst case, right? Yeah, I could just see it now. <laughs> um, but we could get lucky. I mean, ideally. And the singles and the couples tend to stay in place for an average of four to five years. That was my next question. Yeah. And then families, maybe more like eight to 10 years. And, but these are, again, these are all statistics, right? If you're owning a single property, it's going to be hugely skewed. So you could have a tenant move out a month after you purchase, or you could have somebody in place for 20 years after you purchase. And yeah. you know, condition the property is also if you're buying a tenanted property there's no inspections um not even during owner change not even during a, a, a lease renewal you can never enter a property unless by the tenant's request okay. so the best we can do is assume what the condition of the property might be depending on the length of the tenancy and any maintenance request that the tenants filed in the past okay i mean i would assume the tenants are vetted too right like as far as like background checks or credit checks or something like that and they're vetted at the time they sign the lease but if a period has passed since they signed the lease then we don't know what their current situation is yeah 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 yeah. obviously okay. but we do know that that you know whether they've paid on time or have had any issues japanese tenants are a lot better than what you'd find in many other countries definitely compared to the states so um Absolutely. Normally, they wouldn't be a huge issue, but the condition of the interior, again, is something that we can only assume when we purchase, which is another reason that a lot of our clients prefer the uh, single or double bedrooms, uh, single or, or studios, because, you know, renovating uh, one or two rooms is a lot cheaper than renovating a family-sized home, right? Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I like I like the condo route. Um, how how far as far as like um, when you buy a property, is the is the value? I guess I'm trying to think how to ask this question. So like in the U.S., right? There's a lot of homes here that are 100 years old, 120 years old that are renovated and they sell for 500 thousand to millions of dollars sometimes. Yeah. Um, I have I've heard that it's a little bit different in japan as far as like the older the house it's seen as more of like a, like a burden is that is that true or am i way off um no it's very very true for um for single family homes for houses because those are really not built to last in japan so from a tax perspective they completely depreciate in i think 23 years or so and then i mean land can still gain in value but 
the structure itself is considered worthless. They can still, obviously, a lot of them, you know, survive to 40, 50, 60 years, but they do rack up the maintenance costs at that age. So they're going to be selling for a lot cheaper. With condo units, not as much, but with condo units, the especially if you're buying studio or one bedrooms, they're going to be strictly investment properties in the sense that the people who buy them would never want to live in them and the people who and the tenants would never be able to afford to buy them kind of thing. So those are really only evaluated based on the rental income and the rental yield that they command, right? So if rents have gone down in the last 20 years and you know somebody buying the property knows that they're not going to be making nearly as much when a tenant moves out so let's say a tenant's been in there for 20 odd years they're still paying um you know pre or shortly after bubble prices and japanese tenants don't tend to negotiate rent when they renew leases because that's you know from their perspective that's like conflict so but somebody buying the property does know that as soon as that tenant moves out, they maybe get half the rent, right? So they, the the price of the property would depend on what they think that they can get from it. And as a condo, as a building reaches, um, they're mostly concrete, the condo. So as a building reaches, let's say about four, gets close to 40 years of age, building fees tend to rise a lot more rapidly um, because it requires a lot more maintenance. And that obviously affects the yield as well. So we normally recommend to customers, if you're buying a condo, make it 30 years and younger at time of purchase. You have at least five, six, seven years before you need to start considering reselling it. That was my next question. Yeah. And then if you're buying a, a single family home, which, you know, again, if you're not going Minpaku Hotel, I probably would advise against it. But if you are buying a single family home, maybe make it 20 years and younger on purchase just to give you a good 10 years before uh, maintenance costs are racking up again. Yeah, I, I think from an investment standpoint for a first time, I'm definitely leaning more towards the condo. Um, I guess where, where do you recommend in Tokyo would be a good place to look as far as like different, different prefectures like Shinjuku or Shibuya or Ayama or um, so are you laser focused on Tokyo? Because yields there are a lot lower than the rest of the country. Yeah, I would I would like to invest in Tokyo first. Okay. Um, um definitely not Shinjuku Shibuya. There, if you get two, three percent is the best you'd probably get before tax. Um it'll be more the um I'd say anywhere that's let's say within 30, 40 minutes train ride to central Tokyo. So uh um uh, to Shibuya, to Shinjuku, or to let's say uh, Weno, or you know to the palace or whatever central. Let's call it around the Yamanote line, the the, the twenty three wards um, that are around the Yamanote line. Within thirty minutes to any location there is probably feasible. Um, but we'll just, I mean, we'll evaluate them case by case. If something comes up that's a bit further but looks like it's you know on a good transportation line, that that might be feasible as well. Okay. But but with the with the cash that I bring to the table, it's it's pretty realistic to be able to get a condo right in any of the twenty three. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and not within the twenty three wards. It's, I mean, you could buy within the twenty three wards as well, but it'll be older and smaller and far lower on the yield. So I'd probably recommend anything that's within 10, 15 minute uh, ten minute walk to a station that is within thirty that is within thirty minutes uh, train ride to the to the main uh, central area to the Yamanote line. And I ask why Shibuya and Shinjuku have such low yields. Is it because um, of regulation? The super popular, super expensive. Wow. Oh yeah. Well, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, the the price, the, the way it works is, um, the rental price obviously rises as the property is younger and more attractive and more central. But the the property price rises a lot more sharply, and that gap between the two graphs is where you kind of lose your yield. Oh, so the price rises further than the rent. A lot faster, yeah. And don't don't forget that rents haven't gone up in Japan at all. Um, we've maybe had a few central locations where we could rate this them by about 20 bucks a month between tenants, but that's about it. So rents are usually stagnant or go down, at least until some major economical miracle happens. So the What's property the prices are going up because, because of speculators and international investors and stuff like that. But as long as salaries remain the same, nobody can raise the rent. People just can't afford it. 
Yeah. So yeah. looking at a situation where your yield is definitely, again, uh, barring some economical miracle, you're looking at a case where yields will definitely decrease over time. So if you're buying into something that's um, 3 4% and goes down to 2 3% after 10 years or what, it's probably not worth um, exploring overseas for that little, right? What's, what's the interest rate there right now? What's the? The interest rate? I guess for for mortgages over there, um, for owner occupied homes, um, which only Japanese uh, permanent residents or somebody who at least looks like they're close to a permanent residence, owner occupied homes, the interest rates is just under one percent. Wow. Investment loans are kind of two and a half, two to three, depending on the depending on the loan and depending on the lender and depending on the borrower's profile. Are those variable or, or fixed rates? Um, it's up to you. You can lock in. You can lock in both, but I, it's not a huge consideration. R rates haven't been really changing much in Japan in the last twenty or what years. And if you want to kind of you know be safe on both sides, you can specify half of it fixed rate, half of it variable rate kind of thing. Fixed would be I think half a percent higher from memory, but I'm not a big expert on loans. I, I can put you in touch with Emil, who's on our podcast. He knows a lot more than me. <laughs> Because just, just because the vast majority of our customers are cash buyers, so we haven't really delved into it except for our own loans. Yeah, yeah, I wish, I mean, man, I wish I could bring more cash to the table just because, like, it gets me excited, like, the, the opportunities that you're telling me they're, they're in Japan as a whole, but yeah. um, you're saying Tokyo's yields are a lot lower, right, than, like, what, as compared to, like, Kyoto or Osaka? Or... Yeah, so... Let's say not central Osaka, but suburban Osaka, Kobe, Fukuoka, um, Kyoto is hard to find good deals. But when we do find them, Kyoto as well um, would probably go as high as about six percent before tax. Whereas, yeah, whereas Tokyo and central Osaka, if we get four, four and a half, we're very happy. Are most of your clients outside of Tokyo? Uh, vast majority of them, yeah. We've managed to source a few good deals in suburban Tokyo for a few customers, but most of them just are not happy with those yields. But then if you want to stay close to Tokyo, um, Yokohama is a good place, Saitama City a good place, that's just like 30 minutes from Tokyo. Uh, Chiba City is not bad, also gives you proximity to the airport. And those would, again, possibly go up to five and a half, six-ish. Yeah, so it'd be a middle ground between, I see, between Tokyo If you want to stay Tokyo. close to Tokyo, then those are the best options, I'd say. And there's also bedroom communities and, um, you know, prefectural capitals that are, say, within an hour from central Tokyo. They could get good deals as well, but then you're kind of losing out on the uh, growth potential, I'd say. I'm just thinking about everything that you've, you've told me. Um, I think the best route would be to go the single, or excuse me, to go the condo route. Um, I was thinking about doing the GK, but I'm not too sure yet because I don't know if my friend would would buy into that. I think it would have to be. Well, like, the Singapore yeah. the Singapore lender wouldn't require you to set up a company. The interest is higher; it's about three and a half percent from memory. But they let you it's invest in long term lease condos. Yeah, out, out here in the United States, like the Wild West, it's it's crazy here. It's like yeah. um, in 2021, the rates were locked in at around like 3%. Now they're about 8%. So it's like almost like a thousand um, US dollar difference per month. Yeah. In, in, the, <laughs> in the monthly payments, which is insane. Um, but I like, I like Japan a lot. I, I went there and like, um, like I said, I have my friend there. Um, yep. He owns a bunch of good two gems there. Um, he's told me too that it's not a bad idea to start to start looking over there. So, um, I mean, I'm all for this. What's I guess as far as like, what's your timeline? Do, we, do I need to let you know, or like, how how does the process work? Do, well, do I'll I send to... you um, I'll send you our explanation of services document, which explains how we work. There's two options basically. Um, definitely, if you're buying in Tokyo, I can put you directly in touch with a foreigner friendly, really nice real estate agent that can help yeah. can help you conduct the purchase directly, and then, I mean. 
they're nice, but agents are still agents. They're transactional oriented. They're, you know, they're not going to necessarily point out what's the, the pros and cons of each property. They're, they're just, here are the properties you choose and I'll, I'll take care of it for you. So what most of our customers do in that case, if, if they are working with directly with an agent, they bring us on as consultants and that's going to be a few hundred bucks as opposed to a few thousand bucks, which we charge if we're doing everything on your behalf. And we work with normal Japanese realtors kind of the traditional ones. Right. But if you do want to go that route, then we can handle everything for you at a fixed price, which is going to be based on a percentage of the property between three to five percent, depending on what you're buying. Yeah, absolutely. I would I would love to um to retain y'all just because I've listened to your podcast so much. You drop a bunch of knowledge. Um, I'm gonna be honest. I'm coming off of being kind Blushing of now. Thank you. <laughs> I'm being honest. I'm coming off of being kind of sick. So like my my brain's not all, all there right now. Um, but like, I, I know I'm going to start getting ideas and questions popping into my head. So like to have you, to have you on my team, and, um, to pay a fee, like I'm, I'm more than happy to do that, um, to have that relationship established. Like we're happy to, to bring you on yeah, either, either, uh, either structure works for us. Yeah, absolutely. This is, this has been an awesome conversation. I'm super excited now. Um, awesome. so I'm, I'm, I'm off, I'm off for doing this. Like I, I know, um, you might get a lot of people like reaching out to you and like, kind of like on the fence. Um, but like when I decide I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. It's like, I've, yeah, I no, you sound like that. I'm not getting the yeah, feeling for a tire kicker. <laughs> yeah. 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 So like, it's, it's more so of like, how do I get to that point now? Which I already know. I just need to do it. Yeah. Um, so I'll reply to your last email with our explanation of services document that'll lay out exactly um, what's involved in engaging us and how we work and all of that. So just have a quick read through that. And then whenever you're ready, um, just send me a name and address to put on the invoice and we'll get started. Yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much. My, oh, are you are you joining our um, our seminar on Sunday? What time zone are you in? Um, I'm in Central Standard Time. I didn't know there was a seminar on Sunday. Yeah. So if you have a look at my uh, signature at the bottom of the email, you can buy a live streaming ticket, which will let you uh, join the Q and A. But I'm not sure what the time difference is. It might be a bit of an all nighter for you. Um, <laughs> The recordings of presentations and stuff will be available and uploaded to the podcast, but it's a really good chance to just ask questions, get Q&A live. We'll have um, Tracy, who's a Minpaku and hotel expert, Emil, who's a mortgage expert, and um, Anton, who's an Akia and renovation expert and also does Airbnb. So actually, probably a good chance to ask to, to pick their brains a bit, too, if you if you can stay up. Yeah, there. yeah that's that sounds like a great opportunity. I might take you all up on that. Awesome. So yeah, yeah, you'll see that in my uh, signature of the email and I'll reply to your email just now with the explanation of services document and we'll take it from there. Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Speak to you soon. Talk soon. Bye. Thank you. There you have it. Nice, long, comprehensive chat with a savvy young investor. I really enjoyed this one. Hope you did too. And now for our second call, uh, this one is audio only, also with another US-based investor. And she's just about to start investing in Japan for the first time as well. And we talk in more detail about tenants this time around. So long-term tenants versus short-term guests, family tenants versus singles and couples, tenancy laws, landlord obligations, the types of properties that are more attractive to different types of tenants, which are easier to populate. How do rental leases work in Japan? How do yields differ between all of these different strategies? And we then segue into a conversation about yields again, as well as the purchase process itself, how to submit offers, conduct due diligence, contract signing, settlement, all of that. And then finally, we talk vacancies, various locations and times of the year, price comps and how listing prices are determined for investment properties and purchase and running costs again. And once more, potential capital growth, how to engage our services, the usual stuff. Again, super thorough conversation on multiple topics. Enjoy the chat and I'll see you again one last time on the other side. We interrupt this broadcast to tell you about Tokyo Family Stays. They're a short-term rentals company in Tokyo and they offer a home away from home experience, which is just perfect for remote working, quarantining, if that's still a thing, or if you just need somewhere quiet to get away from the world. They offer a variety of options for families, corporate relocations, or even if you're simply transitioning between homes in Tokyo. The properties are super comfortable, tastefully furnished, fully equipped with all amenities, and they accommodate up to 10 people. So really the only thing you'll need to bring with you is your toothbrush and maybe a change of clothes. 
They come with fast unlimited wireless internet, dedicated workspaces and fully equipped kitchens. And they're just a delight to stay in. Fantastic alternative to Japanese business hotels, which if you've ever stayed in one, you probably know they're tiny, they're noisy, fine for a night or two if you're on your own, but longer term or with a family, you'll probably feel you're in a jail cell very quickly in a Japanese business hotel. So if you want to give yourself a sense of space and freedom by renting a real home, with comfortable Western beds, including all the necessities like baby bedding, children's toys, high chairs, etc. You definitely want to reach out to Tokyo Family Stays. They've been at it for over a decade. They're a fully licensed minpaku or short-term stay operator. And as a special bonus for our viewers and listeners, they're also throwing in a breakfast basket upon arrival for anyone who books and mentions the Japan Real Estate Podcast or NTI. And not only for guests, if you're a property owner, you've got an investment property that you want to tweak for higher profit, or a holiday home that you want to rent out when you're not using it via short-term stays, drop them a line today, see how they can help you maximize your property's income. And again, as a special bonus to our viewers and listeners, they're also offering a free audit of your existing short-term stay listings without any obligation whatsoever. So feel free to reach out to them at tokyofamilystays.com. Well worth a visit. And again, if you're in the market for a family home in or around the Tokyo metropolitan area, Emil's your man. Don't be shy to reach out to him as well at sales at realestate.jp. And now back to the podcast. Yeah, so I've browsed through your email. Just let me bring it up again. Um, My first question would be, you mentioned that you're looking for an investment property. Does that mean that you're not going to be using it on your own? So... Probably in the future, I'm gonna use it on my own. So for now, it's for investment property. Right. In that case, can I ask why short-term stay and not just a long-term tenant? So no, not short-term. So I'm looking for long-term, and then maybe in the future, if if possible, can to be uh, can turn it to short-term. Ah, gotcha. So, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. That's just the plan, but if if it's like too much work for me or like for another, like, you know, another side, I'm okay with the long term. It seems like long term is like uh, less work because I do have long term tenants as well. Yeah, definitely and less I, work. I, yeah, less work in the short term, but I know short uh, short term it's. Uh, gets like a, it creates more profits that's what i heard i never done short term before it can be the case but that would for that it would need to be really well managed constantly keeping an eye on occupancy vacancy rates fine tuning it to a particular guest profile so that you can stand out from the competition for those types of guests and so forth so okay. i wouldn't say it's a full time job but it's definitely a lot more uh, bandwidth consumption involved yeah true mm. that is true but that's that's just like long term uh, in the future if if that's possible. But for now, I am way too busy to do that. Yep. So probably now for a couple of years. Well, the other advantage of short-term rentals is you've mentioned that you might want to use the property yourself in the future if you've got a long-term tenant in there. Um, essentially, the way tenancy laws work in Japan is that. A long-term lease is supposedly automatically renewed at the end of every two-year period, and if oh, it's automatically. Yes, you you can't oh. just kick a tenant out, or you can't even <laughs> you can't even just raise the rent on them, right? They've got more rights than you do. I mean, they're Japanese tenants, so they're usually not going to create a problem. But what you'd normally need to do if you want them to leave is notify them and offer them compensation of about a year's worth of rent because that's what it costs them to then relocate to a new place. Oh, yeah. I don't know that. So lease signing fees and deposits and agency fees in Japan tend to be between um, four to six months for new tenants. And then they've got the entire moving expenses. They need to remove everything from the property. Um, and they've obviously lost the initial deposits that they've placed when they moved in. So we normally would offer them a year and then they tend to move out without a problem. So you're saying like give notice for them like a year before? Is that um, the normal saying? lease terms usually indicate six months before renewal is when uh, both parties need to inform each other if they don't want to renew. But with tenants, they can just move out at a month or two's notice usually. 
and the most you'll be able to get from them is a month or two uh, in additional uh, fees. But from the landlord perspective, again, Japanese tenants would normally not take you to court or insist unless you happen to land on a old bored man or, or a foreigner. Foreigner are, are foreigners are a lot more aware of their rights in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, so normally they would move out, but to avoid a situation where they um, try to insist or, or, you know, in severe cases, take you to court, which never happened to us, but could potentially happen. And then we would offer them a one month, comp uh, one year compensation. That's like one year of rent compensation. Correct. Yeah. Which again is, is fair because that's what it costs them to relocate. Oh, well, that's really different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, the reason these laws were made stricter in the past is because landlords were taking advantage of the Japanese tenants. I mean, your average vanilla type Japanese is very docile. They just they just nod their head and go when you tell them to. And landlords were just kicking them out and then charging the whole uh, the whole move in fees again for the new tenant and then recycling that. So the laws have been tightened to disallow them from doing that. OK. All right. That's good to know. Um... What else? Uh, oh, also, I saw a lot of studio sites size compared to or three bedrooms. So, do Japan uh, do Japanese prefer small house? Like, is it more desirable? Um, it just caters to a larger part of the population. So, your tenant base becomes um, bigger and easier to to repopulate a property when it becomes vacant because just the way birth rates are in Japan, a lot of people are staying single, a lot of people are um, elderly folks who never had kids or are just not in contact with their kids, so it's always easy to find a tenant for these smaller properties. Um, but they're obviously lower quality tenants as well, so there, there is something to be said for a larger property that would host a family. Families tend to stay in place longer, so the vacancy would be a bit longer until you find one, but then when they stay in place It'll be for, let's say, on average, eight, ten years as opposed to four or five years for singles. Mm -hmm. And also families tend to take better care of the house than a, a single or, or kind of destitute elderly gentleman. Oh, so is that a property they have? Like, for example, in the U.S., we do have a class A, class B, class C. Is that it depends on the location itself. So I can get like, you know, more quality tenant. Yeah, it's not as strictly regimented in categories, but that's the case here as well, yes. But obviously you're going to get lower yields as well. Japan, In Japan, space is a really premium kind of uh, commodity, so the bigger the property is, it's going to cost much more, but rent will not rise as sharply as the price. Uh, okay. So the yield so in that gap, the yield tends to drop. So if you're looking at these studio or one-bedroom apartments, we can potentially, depending on the city, but we can potentially get up to, say, six, six and a half uh, yield before tax percent. Yeah. Um, with family-sized properties, yeah. except some unique cases, it's normally going to be more like four or five at best. Okay, so it seems like it's better studio and one-bedroom. Okay. And also there's um, there's a sweet spot there with the age. If you're looking at condo units, uh, stuff built between 20 to 30 years ago tends to generate better yield than anything uh, younger, obviously. Uh -huh. And also when the building gets older, it's getting harder and harder to find tenants because even the ones who you know are not very high income earners, if they have other options which are you know similar rent, they obviously go for something cheaper for something newer. And also building fees tend to rise more rapidly as the building approaches about 40 years of age and developers start sniffing around trying to buy it cheaply off the owner union by convincing them that they should sell soon and that's not always at the best price. So the sweet spot is usually 20 to 30 years of age upon purchase and studio or one bedroom unit, maybe two bedroom if it's, um, if it's a particularly attractive deal. But having said all of that, for short-term rentals, it's much better to have family-sized properties because there's a lot of these studio apartments available for uh, for rent on Airbnb and so forth. Mm -hmm. So if you do happen to have a bigger uh, property, then that would generate most likely generate better returns on the short-term front if you ever do that. Okay, but for long-term, it's better studio than one bedroom. Um, it depends on the investor. Some people are happy with higher quality tenants and higher quality properties um, 
you know, and are willing to live with the lower yields because those yields, I mean, those yields that I've just quoted you are on paper when you purchase the property, but newer properties, bigger properties tend to hold their rental values better than these smaller ones. There's again, because there's a lot of competition. So whenever there's a new development built in the neighborhood, it's kind of a race to the bottom uh, begins with all the, all of the people owning older units. Mm -hmm. So that five, a six, six and a half yield might not hold as well as it as a newer, nicer property as well. So they would be lower on yield from purchase, but they would hold that yield for a longer number of years normally. Okay, so that's probably cause flip side. Okay. Yeah. Um, can you tell me like the process of buying a house in Japan? Because like uh, like how long or like for example like yeah or yeah sure offering. And then what else? Like they have appraisal, inspection, you know, requests, repairs, kind of stuff. Okay, so I'll just add one last point to that previous discussion. Is that with them? Um, oh, I lost it now. I wanted to mention one more thing about the yield, and I completely forgot. All right, it'll come back to me. So the purchase process um, here is essentially similar to what you know overseas with a few differences main difference one of the main differences is that when you submit an offer it's not legally binding and you don't need to pay anything when you submit the offer but the the way japan works is everything is very um there's norms and, and manners involved in every process including purchase so it's normally assumed that if you submitted an offer the offer can be pending due diligence and and we'll get into that in a minute but if you submitted an offer without any particular conditions on it, then it's kind of assumed that you're going to go ahead with the purchase if the offer is accepted. So we normally ask our customers not to submit uh, multiple offers and then just go with the one they, they like the best. Just take them one at a time. And if we're pulling back an offer, we need to explain very clearly why we're doing that. Otherwise, that agent will not work with us um, and in most cases with any foreigners again. And... Um, once you submit an offer and the offer has been accepted or renegotiated and then accepted, then it takes about a month from then to signing the contract, at which point you'll be paying a 10% deposit. Okay. And then another month, just because you're overseas and a couple of documents need to be executed and posted here. So another month to settlement normally, which is when you'll be paying the rest of the money. Okay. So the total like about two months to closing? Um, from the moment an offer is accepted, yeah, it could take uh, a bit longer or a lot longer than that until you find the one that you actually want to go ahead with. And there could be quite a few offers that the, the way due diligence works is that a lot of the time the information is not going to be made available before an offer is accepted because the agent and the seller, in case of condo units, the agents and the sellers need to contact the building management company and pay a, a fee of about 50 bucks to get the building's renovation history and reserve funds total and all of the things that we want to look at. Mm -hmm. So what we normally do is we submit an offer and we say this offer is pending uh, tenant information, building information and so forth. And that's when we start getting all of that information. So at that point, there could definitely be a lot of properties that we'll be backing out of because we're not satisfied with that information. Right? Okay. so. During the offer, is there any like it's gonna be like inspection, you know, in you know to see like uh, you know, is there anything need to be repaired, something like major, or, like uh, is Japan do that or like I know, I know like in US it's really big thing but inspection. So, in in the case of tenanted properties, again, tenancy laws are very strict here. No one is allowed to enter a property even when it's being sold. Um, even when a contract, when a lease is renewed, you, nobody enters a property unless it's by the tenant's request. So the only in information about the interior of the... Oh, that reminds me of what I wanted to say too. So the only information on, about the interior of the property is going to be based on what the um, property manager currently knows, which is going to be based on any maintenance request the tenant has submitted. But Japanese tenants, as a rule, try to avoid um, any kind of communication or negotiation or what they label as conflict. So a lot of the time, especially if you've got elderly folks living there, a lot of the time there might be stuff that's broken down over the years and they just haven't uh -huh. reported or done anything about. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it is a bit of a sight unseen. And that, that brings me back to the earlier point that I forgot is that if you're buying a studio or a two bedroom, obviously any renovations and repairs, especially between tenants, are going to be much cheaper than a full sized family home, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So it's 
cause it a kind of like turnkey, right? Am I right? Uh, if it's tenanted, like tenant you could. Tenant. If it's tenanted, okay. you could potentially buy vacant, and then the property mm. the property would have been recently renovated. Uh, but then mm. you're buying into a few months of vacancy and expenses, as opposed to a turnkey income from day one. Okay. Speaking of that, so let's say I buy something like vacant, and you mentioned like two three months vacancy. It, it, it could be like take that long to get a if it's in a good location if it's in a bad location or a bad time of the year it can be even longer than that but we'll try uh -huh. to we'll try to from the get-go steer you towards locations and and properties that would fall into that shorter range that are more desirable but for uh -huh. example let's say you bought in Sapporo or somewhere that's a bit more snowy and and cold long winters if yeah. you happen to lose a tenant during the winter it Normally, oh, people yeah. don't like to move around when it snows, so they'll wait until okay. spring to start moving back in. Yeah, same thing like over here. Holidays is longer. Yeah, yeah. and also, yes. for example, if it's a property that's close to university campus, a lot of your potential tenants are going to be students or faculty, and they mm -hmm. tend to, the hot season for those is usually around February, March, because the uh, school year starts in April here. Mm -hmm. So other times okay. of the year... Um, could take longer to populate. Also, if you're depending on the on supply and demand in the area, the property manager might advise to reduce the rent uh, to compete with other comparable properties. If you'll want to not do that and keep the rent as it was, then it obviously will take longer because we'll have to wait for all of the other offers to be occupied first. Uh, what about things like, uh, I don't know if it's common or not, but I don't see any cops. For example, like uh, over here, we do have it's called AR. Try to remember ARRMS. So uh, A -R -O -M whatever, like, what does that mean? Sorry. Oh, is it MLS? Like we can see like. Uh, oh, say, historical like, sale prices, and that you mean like Zillow and stuff. Correct. Yes. Um, not much of that here. The real estate agents that we work with on each particular sale do have access to a. Uh, uh, Realtor-only historical database, but not all properties appear on there. Um, the only properties that appear in the reigns, which is the name of that database, are properties that the listing agents are willing to share with other agents. But when they do that, they have to share their commission as well. So a lot of agents will not put their properties in that national database because they want to be the uh, exclusive agent representing both sides so they can charge both. What we can do is we can research historical listing. A lot of the MLS websites, uh, we call them MLS, but they're not similar to what you've got there. But a lot of the, um, the bigger websites that have a lot of properties on them also mm -hmm. have archive sections. Mm -hmm. So if there have been recent sales in that building, we could potentially get some data about that. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to compare the prices. Yeah, but with okay. investment properties, that's not really a good indication because... Investment properties are not susceptible to the same trends that you see with owner home properties. So with owner own owner occupied properties, if an area is more desirable and people really want to live there, then that property will rise in price. But with investment properties and those studio and two bedrooms are strictly investment properties. The people who buy them will never want to live in them and vice versa. The tenants who live in them will never afford, be able to afford buying them. So those properties are priced solely on the rental income that they command. So if rents, if the previous sale on that same property or a comparable one was higher, it probably means that rents have gone down in that area. And therefore the, the purchase prices, I mean, investors are just not gonna pay as much if they're not making as much. Okay. Okay, uh, I wanna ask you about the tax. So about the tax rental income, do I have to pay in Japan? Or in the US? You firstly pay in Japan if you're uh -huh. going to be up for it because the minimum threshold here is about 485,000 yen uh, annually net pre-tax. So once you factor in all of your purchase costs and management costs, if you're earning less than 485,000 yen a year, which is about, I think, 4,000 US mm -hmm. at the moment, uh -huh. then you're tax-free. Um, in which point you're only going to be taxed on as part of your normal income tax in the U.S. because you do have to report income from overseas. Um, if you have paid any tax in Japan, then you bring your tax statement um, to your accountant and then Japan and the U.S. have a tax treaty in place, so you're not going to be charged twice, you're just going to be charged for the difference in the U.S. Okay, that makes sense. All right, how about the property management questions? It seems like your company offers that services. 
via so, third party. So everything we do, we're a single point of contact in English, and then we enlist realtors and property managers. We liaise with the building management company, the owner union, but everything is done via outsourcing to third parties. Oh, okay, okay. So you're not doing okay. I see. So, for example, like uh, the property I'm going to get is vacant, and then how does this work? You guys like the screening possible tenants? Um, yes, so there's no credit checks per se like you would yeah. have uh, in the States, but uh -huh. what we normally ask is, um, so if it's turnkey and you've inherited a tenant, then whatever the terms of the lease are, we'll find out. But when we place a new tenant ourselves, we normally insist on a rental guarantee or rent insurance. And then the tenant has to sign up with a um, guarantee company and they check their employment status and credit, not really officially credit website like you can do in the States, but they definitely screen the tenant. And they, if they don't accept the tenant on uh, as guarantors, then we also probably don't want that tenant. The only exceptions are... Um, for example, foreign students or people who have just relocated back to Japan recently and they don't have employment history because they've been overseas uh, previously, then we might consider to take them on, in which case we'll ask them to pay a security deposit instead. Oh, okay. Speaking of security deposit, so not every tenant has security deposit? Um, we can ask them. We, we would normally prefer the uh, guarantee company because the guarantee company will compensate you up to three months of missing rent or... or, mm -hmm. or um, you know, in the case of an absconding tenant and we have to get a court case to uh, uh, one-sidedly terminate the lease, then they'll keep paying rent until that right is granted to us. Mm -hmm. Whereas a security deposit is just going to be a month or two at best. So we prefer to go with a guarantee company if we can. It, it makes for better compensation for the owner. Also, oh, it's like go to a different company again just to get security deposit. Uh, no, security deposit is something, if we, for some reason, the guarantee company refuses to take on the tenant, then we, via the property manager, will just be charging them a cash security deposit instead. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. What else do I want to ask? So, um, turnover rate, do you think that, you know, in Japan, like a lot of turnover rate? Well, I know the lease agreement is like uh, two years. It's a two years rolling lease. So like uh -huh. I explained at the start, it's ex expected to automatically renew every two years. Uh -huh. Unless they tell us like they don't want to renew. Unless they leave, yeah. Um, yeah they and they leave. might leave mid-lease as well. There's not really any huge penalty for them, just a month or two of rent. But normally our average with single tenants has been somewhere between four to five years. So let's call it four and a half. Oh, okay. And with families, something like eight to ten years, so call it nine. Mm, okay. So, do you have any experience like they breaking the lease? You know, I know like the lease like at minimum two years. Let's say they want to move one year, they decide just I want to leave. Are there any any penalty for that? One or two months or of rent is most you'll get from them. Oh, okay. The lease normally stipulates um, two months penalty within the first year and one month penalty within the second year. Now, if you've been following this podcast for a while, and in particular our JREP sessions, you're probably more than familiar with Blanca Kobayashi of Arc Reform. They're a bilingual renovation company serving clients in the Kanagawa and Kanto area. So Tokyo, Chiba, Saitama, Kawasaki, Yokohama. They can handle simple, small-scale projects as well as full house renovations, and they will work with you on the perfect design for your dream family home. But not only homes, Arc Reform also handle commercial property renovations, offices, restaurants, bars, shops, you name it, from traditional classics to the latest trends in interior design and renovations. So you want to email them for a free consultation and quote at info at arcreform.com. That's A-R-K reform, all one word, dot com, and give your home or commercial space the love and care that it deserves. All right. Uh, I think the last one I want to ask you is the fees. Like, what kind of fees that I need to wear from buying and also the, the management? So the purchase costs, assuming you're going through us, the purchase costs are going to be, depending on the price of the property, somewhere between um, 15 to 20% normally. Okay. 
if you're going directly with the Realtor, then you can take our fee off, which is about 5%, uh, at least at the price levels that you're discussing. It gets cheaper if they're more pricey properties. Um, and that consists of the Realtor fee, which is 3% plus 60,000 yen plus tax, which works out to be somewhere between 45 to 5.5%. Our fee, which is 5.5%, these are all including consumption tax. So it's actually 5% plus 10%, uh, uh, the equivalent of GST. So 5 becomes 5.5 and, and so forth. Um, legal and registration fees, depending on the price of the property, are going to be somewhere between 3 to 6%. They vary depending on the official evaluation, which is always different to market price. And then so, the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Continue. Yeah, I was going to ask you, uh, management fee? Yeah, hang on. We're not done with the purchase fees yet. <laughs> okay, bye, bye. And then there's a purchase tax statement, which comes in somewhere between six to 24 months after the purchase, depending on which period of the year you've purchased in. Mm -hmm. And that is worst case about two and a half percent, usually closer to about one and a half percent, because again, it varies depending on the official evaluation. So if you add all of those together, the purchase cost would come to worst case 20 percent, uh, maybe closer to 16, 17, depending on the price of the property. Okay. And then management costs. Management costs, so the property managers charge 5% plus tax normally of the gross rental income. That's monthly? That's monthly, yeah. Okay. Um, that's include like, uh, for example, like a, a screening tenant and kind of stuff, it's 5% or like... That's, yeah, for, here. that's for managing the property while it's tenanted. I'll get to the placement costs in a minute. Okay. Okay. So five and a half percent. So five percent plus tax. So five and a half percent of the gross rental income per month. Um, in some areas where there's only a handful of them available, they might charge a bit more than that. In bigger cities where there's a bunch of them available, they might charge a bit less. But the average, the industry norm is usually five and a half percent. And building fees very much vary depending on the building. So when we analyze investment deals for you, we'll put in all of those fees and you'll see the bottom line, but the building fees can be anywhere from 5,000 yen a month to 20, 30,000 yen a month, depending on how fancy and how new the building is. Okay. Um, but those percentage yields that I've mentioned at the start, say up to six, six and a half percent, those are including all of those fees. And then our fee for managing a property is a minimum of 3,080 yen per month or 2,800 plus tax. Um, and we charge, if you happen to get a property, but I don't think it, the budget you've specified, probably not. But if you happen to uh, generate to purchase a property that generates um, beyond 160,000 yen per month in rent, then we just charge 2.2%, which becomes then higher than the 3,000. But that, that's not likely going to be within your budget, a property that generates as much as that. Okay. And then placement fees. The property managers charge one month themselves, but they also share the listing with other property managers to try and speed up, uh, speed up the tenanting. Uh, if another property manager sources a tenant, then they also need to get paid one month. So the normal fees are between one to two months when they place a tenant. Okay. And then um, we charge half a month regardless of where the tenant came from. So one and a half to two and a half is the minimum. And again, if the property is in a location or a time of year or the rent price that you want to get is making it more challenging, then we would have to offer various bonuses. So, for example, we might offer an increased commission to any property manager who can find us a tenant. So that'll be maybe one month extra or we might offer a first month free of rent to a tenant, which also makes it one month extra. If it's really, really tough, we might suggest to do both of these or an alternative to that would be to maybe um, owner participates in the move in fees for the tenant, which can also come to about a month, month and a half. So we'll take it case by case. If we see within a month or two that it's extremely challenging, then we'll start suggesting to, to increase the placement costs by offering one or more of these bonuses. That's good. I mean, you'll have a lot more once we start looking at individual properties, I promise. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, uh, speaking of the individual property, uh, any suggestion, you know, uh, city-wise or 
I don't know. You have more experience than me. Um, I'd say... So you're saying that you've got other, what we normally ask customers is what sort of other investments they got, whether in other countries or in Japan. In your case, it's not in Japan, but what does the rest of your portfolio look like? Is it relatively high yield? Is it relatively safe and stable? What, what's, what does it look like? So for me, I would say quite high yield. Uh, okay. Since I manage my own, that's mean no fees at all. The only fees obviously is maintenance, which is very high in the US. But uh, I got so far pretty good tenants. They're pretty quiet. They're not like keep calling me every day or at night. You know, get something. Yeah. They um. Let's see. It's pretty. Uh, it's not that risky. I think I would say pretty stable. And besides, I bought those property before pandemic. Yeah. And then the rental is pretty high. It's pretty profitable. It's okay. Just, yeah. Um. But. Well, in that, I mean, it's up to you. In that case, we can continue with the safe and stable, in which case I'd probably recommend uh, one of the top seven cities in Japan. So Tokyo, Osaka, Fukuoka, Kyoto, Nagoya, um, Yokohama, maybe Sapporo, if we can find good deals there, because we want to aim for higher yields in, in colder climate properties. Just maintenance costs and vacancies tend to cost more. Um, appreciation, like yeah, so that was going to be the second point. If you want to aim for potential appreciation, which is anyone's guess in Japan, but it has been happening in bigger cities in the last 12 years, uh -huh. then I would stick to those cities. Um, and then the best you'd probably generate is five and a half percent less if it's in Tokyo or central Osaka. Um, in Fukuoka, we sometimes can manage six percent. In Nagoya as well, but tenants tend to be a bit more blue collar, so we have more um, absconding and kind of, you know, potentially slightly delinquent tenants in Nagoya. Um, otherwise, if you want to aim for just higher yields, cash flow, that sort of thing, then we can also look at prefectural capitals or uh, bedroom communities around the bigger cities. They would potentially get up to six, six and a half percent, but then I'd say capital growth potential is iffy at best. Uh, is that uh, the yield after the tax or before tax? Before tax. That's before tax. But again, at that budget, you're probably not going to be paying much tax in Japan. So it's just a matter of what sort of tax situation you've got in the U.S. for the uh, for the rest of it. Okay. I was wondering if you can give me sample uh, from, let's say, the high yield and possibly the, the the one with appreciation. I just want to compare. Yeah. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'll ask, we can put in a couple of hours of co just complimentary research before you've actually engaged us, just to give you an idea of okay. what's out there. Okay. So if you could reply to our last correspondence uh, asking to see some samples, then uh, Faye, who has been answering you previously, will we'll get that done for you over the next couple of weeks or so. Okay, so let's say I'm interested, like, do I need to sign a con sign contract with you and I have to pay an advance first, or how does it work? So to engage us, so we can put in again those couple of hours complimentary research and I'm always happy to jump on calls and discuss particular properties and issues and stuff. But when you want us to dig in deeper and do more research and start contacting agents and sellers and so forth, at that point we will need to be engaged. So there are two documents that you'll need to have signed and witnessed, our contract of services and our limited uh, power of attorney to enable us to work here on your behalf. Um, you can take your time executing those. We'll only need to show them to anyone when we're getting closer to signing a contract. Um, but we do need our fee estimate paid in advance. So we'll charge you based on what you think the budget is. And then post settlement, we'll credit or debit depending on the end purchase price. Okay, that sounds fair. Yeah. All right. I think, yeah, let's start from there. Starts good. That sounds good. So um, again, just reply to our last correspondence with what exactly you want us to search for and we'll get Faye on that for you. Okay, so you just want to email you back? Like, what do I want to... Yeah, budget, uh, budget, minimum yield, budget? maximum yield. And if you want to see samples from various yields or various types of cities, just put that in there as well. Okay, all right. I'll do that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Great speaking to you. All right. Bye. Have a good day. You Bye. too. All right, nice few conversations again. Hope you enjoyed them. Uh, and once more, if you still haven't secured your tickets for the April 6th summit in Tokyo, either in person or via the live stream, hop over to nippontradings.com now and grab your tickets. They are selling fast. 
Now, before we go, we're also, as always, going to tell you and also link to our other sponsor's website. That's Hiroshi Shimizu, immigration lawyer and administrative scrivener. If you're thinking about moving here on a more permanent basis, or you're already in Japan on some sort of a temporary visa, and you want to switch to a longer term or permanent one, or if you're considering setting up a local company or a branch office of a foreign company, and you've got any sort of business or visa-related inquiries, or even if you just want to find out what your options are on any of these topics, feel free to contact Hiroshi Shimizu. You can find him at japanimmigrationexperts.com. And he can help you set up a company, apply for any kind of visa, or just provide you with the best advice and extremely affordable consultation related to these topics. And he's already done that for many of our listeners. So feel free to reach out to him. Again, that's japanimmigrationexperts.com and you'll be well on your way. And that's it from us for today, folks. Hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Japan Real Estate Podcast. Do share it with your networks and please let us know what you think. So leave us a short rating or review on the iTunes store, on Spotify, or just drop us a line in the comment section of wherever you might have found this episode. We love hearing from you. Hope to have you with us again next time. And until then, have a great day or night ahead. Yoroshiku. Yoroshiku.